Amen. Um, if you want to take your seats, guys. Um, first, I just wanted to apologize. Those of you that have not been able to park your car on the car park and you've had to go and park somewhere else. Unfortunately, we don't know who's blocking the drive, so we can't move the car until they let us know who they are. Um, so apologies about that. Um, I just wanted to say welcome to everybody, and I can see a couple of new faces. So we do have a little gift for the new people. So if you want to raise your hand, we'll give you a little gift. We know who you are anyway. <laughs> so it's really good to have you with us. It's really good to see familiar faces, but it's really good to see new faces as well. So I hope you enjoy your time with us today. Um, so I'm just going to give a few notices. This morning, we're going to have, after the notices, we're going to have a, a short offering talk. And then a couple, Elaine and Dexter, are going to give a short testimony. And then um, Andrew's going to be giving the word. So I'm going to give you a few notices. And we, we seem to get more notices every week. And part of me is like, oh, that's a lot of notices. And then part of, part of me is like, that's because we're doing a lot of stuff. So that's good, a, a lot of opportunity to reach out. So the first thing I wanted to tell you about is um, something we started just a few weeks ago, which is a coffee morning on a Tuesday between 10 and 12. And um, you know, the first couple of weeks were quite quiet, quite slow. But last week was, I wasn't here, but I've been told it was a really amazing time. There were a few new people and some testimonies that came out of it. Um, I'm sure Iris, Sharon or Andrew, who were all here, would be willing to share with you if you're interested to know. But if you're free, come along. It's for anybody. You can bring whoever you like. And it's just a time to just sit and chat. Just get out of the house. Come and have a nice hot drink, a few biscuits and just have a chat with people. So invite people, bring them with you or just send them along. Then the next one is Bible study, which this week is on Wednesday evening. It's on Zoom this week. So if you want to join, just let us know. We can get the Zoom link to you. Starts at 7 o'clock. So everybody, welcome to join that. Then we have Outreach on Thursday, which Tegan will be leading. Uh, if you're interested in taking part, Tegan is... Tegan, can you identify yourself? That is Tegan, who just put, her hand up, put your hand up again, Tegan. So that's Tegan, if you're interested... Um, she can let you know what time it's going to be and we're, we're actually just reaching out to the very local area so knocking doors and speaking to people asking them if they know we're here if they've got any prayer requests if we can help them so if you're interested at all let Tegan know um, next Thursday so I know I'm giving you a lot of notices but just remember the ones that you want to be involved in yeah you haven't got to remember them all so next Thursday we have a prayer evening um, at 7 p.m., so that's next Thursday. So you'll be reminded about that on Sunday, but I just wanted to let you know. So that's next Thursday at 7. Now, I just want to tell you about a couple of things that are coming up. So I've been telling you all about the impact training. I know I have because I feel very repetitive telling you all again. But we have impact training, which is a, a man called Jonathan Comrath. He's a very, very good teacher of the word, and he does teach in evangelism, but not just evangelism. So there's a lot of topics he's going to cover, and that is the 12th, 13th <laughs> and 14th of July, I forgot what dates it was then, which are the training days. And then the 15th of July is a Saturday. It's a free event on the 15th. And that's for anybody who wants to come along. It's going to be a roundup of the teaching, followed by some outreach in the afternoon and then a, a kind of healing outreach meeting in here in the evening. So that's going to be awesome. And I know as I look around the room, there are... There are a few of us in here that are already signed up. It is going to be good. And there's going to be new people that we've not met as well because it's open to, to anybody. It's being advertised wherever they decide to advertise. So I know it's being open to anybody. So we might get some new people too. So if you're watching on a um, live stream as well, please have a scroll down the Facebook page and you will find the link to sign up. It's an Eventbrite event. So you can sign up on the internet. Another thing I want to tell you about is coming up at the end of July, beginning of August, we haven't fixed the date yet, we're going to have our very first baptismal service here. So um, we actually, for those of you that don't know, we have a baptismal at the back of the room, underneath the sound desk. So yes, the sound desk won't be there on that service, um, but we will be using the baptismal there. So if you have not been water baptised yet, and you would like to be, please let us know, because we want to meet with you guys who want to be baptised beforehand as well, just so we can go over what, what baptism is and why you do it. So that will be either the last... Sunday in July or the first Sunday in August, but we'll give you more information about that as the time comes. Um, 
Another exciting thing that I haven't announced at the church yet, I think, is those of you that know John Donnelly and Susan Donnelly, maybe not all of you, but they are a, a lovely couple. They're from Scotland. John's been, he was a pastor for, oh, I don't know how long, 20 or more years in Scotland, a small church called Glenaros, um, along with his wife, Susan. Really lovely couple. They actually uh, married me and Andrew, so we know them quite well. They're friends of ours. And they're going to be coming here on the 12th and 13th of August. So we're going to have a Saturday evening and a Sunday morning, so they both get a chance to minister. But they're a really, really lovely couple. And um, both of them are very prophetic as well. So they, they speak words over people. Okay, let me put this the right way. So they hear from the Holy Spirit, not that we don't. We all hear from the Holy Spirit if we're born again. But they hear from the Holy Spirit, and they speak words, and it confirms. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes you might think, you know what, I feel like I'm called to this. And they have a very good gift where they'll speak it over you, and you're just like, wow, wow. I know that's God because they just confirmed exactly what he put in my heart already. So they're, they're an awesome couple, though. They're so loving. So they just make you feel like you're at home. Wherever you are, when you're speaking to them, you feel like you are at home. So please come along. It's going to be a really, really great weekend, that is. And we'll give you more information about that. And then the very last thing to remind you about, because I've mentioned this before, we have a UK mission trip coming up at the end of August. So we have a team coming. They'll be coming from Europe, America, different places. And we'll be going. Um, the, the locations are on there, aren't they? So Wolverhampton... Liverpool, Manchester, Warsaw, and Birmingham. Now, the Liverpool and Manchester ones will involve travelling and staying overnight. So if you're interested in coming on the whole trip, you need to be able to do those two days. Um, but if you just want to get involved in one of the local ones, because we've got Wolverhampton, Warsaw, and Birmingham, so that means that any of you that just want to get involved for a day, or the three days, the local ones, you can get involved just for those as well. So do let us know, and we will give you more info about that. If you're interested, just come and see me, and I'll be able to tell you more. But we've done these UK trips quite a lot, and they're awesome, you know, because you, you see people on the streets, and they're just, they're just breaking to tears in a good way because they meet Jesus on the street. You know, they've just gone down the shops to buy something, and next thing they know, they're being introduced to the, the Savior of the world. You know, their life is just being instantly transformed in the middle of the street. And, you know, it's, it's awesome to see. People get baptized in the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues on the street. We've had people healed on the street, and that many words of confirmation, you know, that we'll just bump into somebody, have a conversation with them. And then during the course of the conversation, somebody from the team will say something to them, and they're just like, do you know what? I prayed about this this morning. I asked God to confirm a word, or I asked God to send me a person or show me a church or whatever it might be. And it's just, it's just amazing to just go out there and just be the hands and feet of Jesus and be able to minister to people on the street. So if you're interested, please do let us know. Now, I'm going to hand over to Louise, who's... Just going to give us a short talk. So, Louise. <laughs> Bless. Here you go, Louise. Thank you. So, I was just putting the mission dates in my diary. <laughs> okay, well, good morning, everybody. How are we today? Awesome. So, um, who knows who our provider is? Louder, Devon. The Lord, he says. Yes, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. And my talk today is going to be based around 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10 to 15. And I'm just going to read it to you from the message. So God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything, more than just ready to do what to be done. As one psalmist puts it, he throws cautions to the winds, give in to the needy in reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out and never wear out. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meal is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something you can then give away, which grows into full formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. Carrying out this social relief work involves far more than helping meet the bare needs of poor Christians. It also produces abundant and bountiful thanksgiving to God. This release offering 
is a prod to live in your very best, showing your gratitude to God by being openly obedient to the plain meeting, meanings of the message of Christ. You show your gratitude through your generous offerings to your needy brothers and sisters and really towards everyone. Meanwhile, moved by the extravagance of God in your lives, they'll respond by praying for you in passionate intercession for whatever you need. Thank God for this gift, his gift. No language can praise it enough. And I just thought there was so much in it and I only have four minutes left. So I just thought blessings in astonishing ways. Who, who here thinks I must be blessed that way? But God can bless us in the way that we need to be blessed at that time. And when it says astonishing, it's like, I didn't even know I needed that need. Or I would have been waiting for someone to meet that need for me. And then they provide. So I'm going to go through, and Crystals will now put it up on, the, up on the screen. But through that same scriptures, but through the NLT version. So for God, who is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat, in the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So that, that seed of generosity has to grow. It has to be cultivated on the inside of you. And the way you do this is you start. You start by giving something that you have that someone else needs. That could be your time. That could be a thing. That could just be something. Everyone's got a gift and a talent and an ability and you're sowing that, and that is all, all going towards thankfulness to God. So in verse 11, it says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Well, what if you weren't generous with your time because you didn't have time, but now you've been generous with your money, or you've been generous with your belongings, and now I have time to do something, serve in the church, or something else, because now you've been enriched. Maybe you were only able to give like Julio, a hundred pound, but now he can give a thousand pound. What if whatever it was that you're generous with, he can enrich you in every area of your life? And then the rest of the verses, and when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. And in verse 12, so two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will be joyful, expressing their thanks to God. And then in verse 13, as a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them, to all believers, will prov prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And each and every one of those three verses says that the person you're generous to will give thanks to God because they will see God through you. And that's the whole point. They, you want, we want people to see Jesus through us in your giving. So everyone here has an ability. They have a service. They have a skill because we're the body of Christ and we need each other. And you meeting that person's need shows God through you. And that in turn turns their faces back to God and giving thanks. And then in return, verse 14, it then comes full circle and comes back to you. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. And God, in the verse 15, is thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. So his gift was Jesus to us. And that is, that is the, whole, the whole point of him giving first, and then we give back. So today I just want you to be mindful, is there a talent, is there a gift, is there a service, is there something that you can provide, whether it's monetary, whatever it is, to your brother and sister, to the saints, to the body of Christ that you can give and then they will see God through you and then you'll come back around full circle and they'll pray for you. So we've got outreach to the flats or the coffee mornings. We're providing free tea and coffee for them. They're also having the word. So we want God to work through us so that they can see God in them and then they can receive. We, we went up there this morning to try and find whose car it is and um, we didn't find much joy. But we found lots of people that are in need of God. So even that was still a ministry thing, because hopefully we were nice and polite and smiling. <laughs> Please move your car. <laughs> but 
But then also today I was able to give my time. So there's um, friends of mine that they're going to Romania on a mission trip today. So I drove them four o'clock this morning to Birmingham airport. And I know there's other people that have provided a, a, a service and driving people to the airport today. And it's all just to give thanks to God. I've sown into their mission trip to Romania by driving them to the airport. So I thank God for us. I thank God for the seeds that are sown today, the seeds that we have still yet to cultivate in our hearts. And I just like the idea that generosity is a seed and it needs to be cultivated. Then it can grow and then you'll be more generous. And then in return, more people give thanks to God and then more people see God through you and then more people pray for a need you didn't even know that you had in there. So I just wanted to, um, Julia's gonna come around with the offering basket in a minute, but when he does that, while he's doing that, I'll just pray over it and I believe the bank details will be put up on the screen for us. So Father, I just thank you for the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the, the services, the, the body of Christ who can provide for each and every one, that you've designed it to help each other out. To, to boost, to lift up, to raise up, so that through that goodness, through that generosity, they see you and they come into your kingdom. And we just thank you that you are the one who builds your church. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hello. Thank you for that, Louise. Um, so now, um, previously what we used to do was we would have people from within the church just come and give testimony at the front, um, mainly about how they met Jesus, unless they told us, you know, they've got another testimony that they'd like to share. Um, and we haven't done it for a while, but today we're going to have Elaine and Dexter, who are married. They're going to come forward and share testimony together. So Elaine and Dexter, if you'd like to come forward. Yeah, the, the, the clock's up there, mate. You can watch yourself as well. Who am I giving it to? Me. You. <laughs> right. Um, well, I, I didn't really come from a Christian home. As, uh, as, as brought up as a Catholic. Um, I never really had a good father. He was, a, he was too busy chasing other women and not really looking after us. And I was a bit of a problem, really. I mean, you wouldn't think that, really. I was always, I was always in trouble. Um, I was uh, as a problem at school. I was a problem at home with the neighbours. Um, was it? Um, yeah, I was a problem at school and. Uh, was it? Mm. Uh, uh, uh. Yes. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I was always in, in, in tons of trouble. And then he came close to getting expelled from school, but I just got suspended. And then went into senior school, and I was already there for about half a year because um, I wouldn't I was hardly ever go in there. So I got put in uh, like a special boarding school where I had to go. Um, I was there for till I was 16, and I left. And I tried a bit. Of, I tried it in the army for a bit, but that didn't last long. So, well, I, I was just drifting, and then, well, fact, to '84, I was, I was always getting trouble with the police and things. And '84, I finally ended up in prison. I got six months, and I was in I went to Liverpool jail, and that sort of like shocked the family and whatnot. And was it, I should have stayed in. in I should have stayed in. Um, in, in Liverpool jail, but for some reason I got moved to another prison. Not, not, not nothing in, in trouble or anything like that, but just got. But, but I believe that God sent me to another prison because that's where I met. That's where I met Jesus. And uh, it was one day I was in that. I was in Preston jail for it was about a month into my sentence there, and I was on the fourth floor. I was on the landing, 
and there's a lad, Terry George, his name was, and he's coming. He's on the third foot walking along, and there's just something about him. I didn't. I couldn't. He was like, he looked so happy and radiant, and and people were giving him a bit of a hassle, like shouting, "Devil, devil's behind you, Terry, Terry!" And he, he's just like shaking it off, and he's just like so. He, there's just I can't explain. It. It's just something. He just looks different. I thought, what? Well, how come he looks happy in a place like this? And I wanted to get to know him. And the following day, I saw him on the exercise yard, but I'd been there about a month and never saw him. And he's on the, on the, uh, in the exercise yard. And he sort of like introduced, and that's where I got introduced to Jesus. And then I got, became a Christian in prison. Then I got released. And then I, came, I started going to a brethren church. Cause, and everything was going quite well till uh, about 86 when my mum passed away with cancer. And I fell away. Then I got back into my drinking, and not, never really got into trouble, so, but uh, I got into the biking scene as a motorcyclist and doing various things. And then I, I moved, moved, around the co moved around the country. I couldn't really settle. Uh, well, so fast forward to 2007. Um, I just came out of a bad relationship. And I just really wanted to get, because in between then I was, I, was, I, was, I was known as a chair shopper. I was going into church for a bit and then coming pop, up and out again. I couldn't really settle. And um, fast forward to 2007, I just came out of a really bad relationship. And I, I just felt I wanted to come back to the Lord. And I, I joined a Christian dating agency. And because I, I wanted to move out. Uh, it's like always living in the past. I wanted to go to sea houses where I uh, my family, family holidays. So I wanted to. Uh, I didn't really like the West Midlands either, did I? And um, anyway, I joined this Christian Day agency, and um, anyway, up popped the lane. And uh, not just like that, but uh, that was in 2007, two, then 2008, we got married, and well, here I am. Here I am. Right, hello everyone. I just think it's amazing because God's got a sense of humour. So Sexter says he never wanted to live in the West Midlands. So where's he living now? <laughs> anyway, um, my testimony is very different from that of Jackster's. I was brought up um, going to church, going to Sunday school. I went to Girls Brigade, which some of you might know, some of you won't know, but it's sort of similar to Brownies, but it was more um, of a church base, and you did activities and quite like that, and also you, you, you know, had Bible time as well. But in the church I was brought up in, there was hardly any other young people, and I always used to think that, you know, it was older people that went to church, and, and that was quite difficult as well, because there wasn't very many people in the church either. And then there came a time in that church, um, when I was, in my t I was in my teenage years, where there were difficulties in that church. And now I know why, because of all that we've been taught. But the fact is, at the time, things go around in your head as to why is that happening? If there's a God, why this? And all these questions. And then it turns around and, you know, well, if there is a God and he comes back, where am I going? And all these things would go around in my head continuously, quite often at night when I tried to go to sleep. And in the end, we left that church for various reasons, and we went to a different church. And, and Sundays were the worst day of the week for me. I didn't want to go to church. When I went to university, obviously I left that area, and I went somewhere, I went up to, Not to um, Nottingham. And whilst I was there, I would go to church maybe, and you know, and I joined a Navigators, um, which is a bit like a Christian union, because you know my nan has always said you need to be with Christian people, and it wasn't that I was against them. It's just I was probably that far from being a Christian. You know, if you're going to say there's always a gap, but I was that close, but never had you know. And then I was quite seriously ill in my at the end of the first term at university. I had the flu and if you have had the flu you will know how bad that is because people will tell you I've had the flu but they haven't had the flu and it really knocked me about when I went back for my second term I couldn't do anything literally I just couldn't get out of bed basically I was so fatigued and so I was sent to sick bay everything looked dark from where I was the doctors wanted to put me on antidepressant tablets I refused because I didn't want them I thought there was something wrong with me and basically for about, you know, I was in there for a week and 
my life could have been very different because my mum wanted me to come back home and she told me if I came back home I wouldn't go back to university so if that had happened I probably wouldn't be here today but I refused and I carried on and there were people there was a friend of mine who wasn't a Christian but she lived with a couple who went to church who took me in for three weeks and just said come and stay in like downstairs we'll put you up a bed you can do your work and things they looked after me and I got through that bit and then it was just somebody saying something to me after I'd been to a navigators meeting and I just thought you know when something just sometimes just clicks basically and then I just kind of realized and I gave my life to Christ um, and I went home into my bedroom and what happens then if, if you you can really feel the difference it's like all your birth well you've been bogged down by so much stuff depending on what that stuff is it's all different for each of us because we've all got a life um, journey but it was like a complete release and I still wasn't 100% in my health at that time but within a week I was eating again because I lost a lot of weight and stuff um, but I didn't know the connection then between salvation and healing because we weren't taught it in the churches I went to but obviously at that point I was healed as well but following on from that things when you, you know in the Christian life, or what, you, know, you don't have an easy life being a Christian as the Bible teaches us. And if you don't renew your mind, you're going to be in difficulties as well. So I carried on going, in, you know, going to church, but didn't really understand what was the true word because we weren't in the t churches I went to, we weren't taught about the baptism of the Holy Spirit or various things that we now know. And so I just carried on like that for a time. I was helping out at Girls' Brigade. But I was quite ill during my, my life. I would be, when I say ill, um, you know, every few weeks I'd have a cold or I'd have something else wrong with me. And I just didn't understand why. But I think it wasn't until um, we started going to, uh, I think we went to the Rock Church in 2012. We found out about Carrie's College. Bible college and I didn't at that point I didn't even want to go to college it was like oh they go to college I go to work but the interesting thing is God works you know and knows where he wants you to be because there came a time when um, Dexter said to me he wanted to move to somewhere that he'd liked on holiday when we were coming back in 2016 and listen I'm just going to share with you because I think your word, the words are so important what you speak and I said in coming back in the car I said I'm not going to move anywhere until I've been to Carrie's. Bible college came out of my mouth. And then I said, I don't know how that's going to happen because I don't want to do night school because they did night school then. I, can't, I don't feel that I'm called to leave my job and I don't want to do the correspondence course. And I left it at that. Two days later, I found out they were going to start a Saturday school at, and I couldn't wait to, to put my application in. And, and um, we actually both started there in, in the first time they were running the Saturday school. And so we did two years at Bible college and learned so much and went on mission trip. And, I've, and I believe God's totally changed me through that experience because I used to be a um, very quiet person as well. I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't get up at the, at the front and say anything. But now God's called me to actually change things. And, you know, it's not me, it's God, because he says to us in Jeremiah, he said to Jeremiah in chapter one that he would give him the right words to say. And I have to, you know, rely on God to give me the right words to say, because without him, I can't do anything. So now I'm actually involved in politics as well, which I could never have imagined and things that are just coming from that. And it's all God. So that, that's my testimony. Awesome. Good job, guys. Was that not good? Amen. Testimonies are very powerful. And we need to, to not only keep going back over them ourselves in our own hearts, but to, to share them with people as well. Because you never know what you've been through, obviously somebody else might be going through. And you can, as uh, Louise was saying, you can be the, the Jesus for that person. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. You know me, guys. I need some. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome uh, the new people that are here. So hello. It's good to see you. Thank you for coming. Hadassah. Be good. 
So I'm going to share the word today, and I, I think this is um, an appropriate time to share what I've got to say, to be honest. Uh, God's been speaking to me about it, and it's a question that I'm asked a lot. I'm asked by Muslims. I'm asked by, um, sometimes you speak to Buz- uh, Buddhism, <laughs> monks, that kind of stuff. I've seen them in their orange, their orange clothes, you know, the Buddhists. Um, I've spoken to just n- not normal people on the streets, and they ask me this question. So it's a question that many Christians ask me as well. And this is what my question is. Why do I need to be born again? You Christians, they say to me, you Christians always talk about being born again. Why can't I just serve God? Why do I need to be born again? And so what I want to do today is unpack the reason that we need to be born again. Amen? Amen. Because it's, um, it's, it's a question that, that needs to be answered, you know? Because we, we say to people, you know, you need to come and you need to know Jesus and you need to be born again. But what is that? Why, why is that? You know? So let, let's, let's, let's have a look at what the scriptures say and um, see if we can get to the bottom of it. So let me just pray quickly, and then we'll get into it. So, Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father, that will give me the words to speak today, Lord. I pray that the words bless us, they encourage us, and they give us knowledge, Father, in who you are and why you do the things you do and the way you do it, Father. And so we thank you for Jesus, Lord, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So my main scripture is John 3, 3. So this is a man who came to Jesus. He wanted to speak to Jesus. So he arranged a meeting with Jesus, and his name was Nicodemus. Everybody heard of Nicodemus before? Yes? Okay. So Nicodemus came at night. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee, so he was like a priest. And he was like one of the top guys, so he was the one running the show. Uh, And they did all of the laws, they did all of the rituals, they did all of the traditions because they wanted to get to God based on their own works. So if you turn to John 3, 3 with me, this is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. And he says this, this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, so this is, he's saying it, you know, this is serious. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So this is Jesus speaking. So if these are Jesus, the words of Jesus, then we should take them seriously. Amen? And he's saying that if we are not born again, we will never see the kingdom of God. Serious. He's not saying you might see some of it. He's, He's not saying you might see a little bit of it. He's saying you will not see any of it unless you are born again. But again, I've spoken to many Christians and they've told me that they are Christians. And then I ask them, are you born again? And they say no to me. So there is a lack of understanding that these people need to be born again. So there are people right now today out there who are convinced in their heart they're going to heaven. They're convinced in their heart that what they're doing is for God. They're convinced in their hearts there is going to be salvation on the day of judgment. But this is telling us, unless you are born again, you will see none of that. Any of it at all. As I've said before, it doesn't matter how much time you spend sitting in the garage, you don't become a car. It doesn't matter how much time you sit here in this church, it doesn't make you a Christian. So, let's go to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. So this is when, <laughs> it sounds a bit weird, when God is speaking to himself. And he says, let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle. Over the over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God created men and women. Okay? 
And this is two things. In his image, can you put that scripture back up, please? Um, thank you. In his image and also in his likeness. So that's two things, okay? It wasn't just one thing, it was two things. So keep that in your mind. Two things, image and likeness. So Genesis 2, 5 to 7 says this. Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So there was no rain, mist came up from the ground. And verse number 7 says this. And the Lord God formed of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So this is now image. Your eyes, your nose, your ears, your mouth. He formed a man from the mud. He said the, water, that the mist came up out the ground and that mixed with the dirt and, and created mud. And so God formed a man on the ground, Adam, that looked like God in his image. Then it says this, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So the breath here that it was speaking about in the Greek, young Nicholas, is the word pneuma. Yeah? And it can be translated breath, spirit, or wind. Okay? So God has now breathed into this inanimate object his own spirit. Okay? And from that moment, the man stood up and became alive. In that spirit was the nature of God. Okay? So the nature of God now gave that man the capacity to be in God's likeness. So he's in his image already. He's created him at the, the ground. Now that breath, that spirit, because of God's nature being in that spirit, he is now capable of looking like God. In a sense where if you have a child, when the child gets a bit bigger, Somebody might say, oh, he's just like his dad. His dad does that. Or he's just like his mom, or she's just like her mom. So do you get what I'm saying? So it's your personality, how you, how you talk sometimes, your mannerisms, that kind of stuff. That's the likeness. So image is what you look like. Likeness is how you behave. So this man now has the capability and capacity, because of the spirit in him, to act like God, to speak like God, to think like God. This is just awesome. So now we have a man who's created, and I'm going to knock on about it because this is about being born again. A man that has, looks like God and has the capability to act like God as well. And so we know that God created the woman, Eve, out of the man's rib. So now there's two, man and woman. They both have the same spirit, they both have the same nature, and they both have the same features. They look like God and they can act like God. So Genesis 2.9, God put them in the garden. We know the Garden of Eden. And it says this, And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So it wasn't the tree of good and bad. People say that. It was the tree of good and bad. No, it wasn't. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah? So, that being the case, my question is this. What moral standard did Adam and Eve live by if there was, if there was no understanding of good and bad, good and evil? They had no knowledge of it. So where did their moral standard come from? Where did their knowledge of what was right and what was wrong come from? Just think about it for a second. These are things I think about. So these, these two people are walking around and they've got no understanding of what's good and what's bad. But they have the spirit of God in them. So how about this? So they're watching their father. They're watching what he does. They're listening to what he says. And they're copying him. Because they have no other compass point or reference to, to go by. So what they start to do is they start to copy their father. Just like our children copy us. 
Yeah? So they, they were watching, they were learning, and they were starting to look like God. And we know in Genesis 3 they were tempted. So Satan came to them, Lucifer, Satan, and he tempted them and says to them, there's something that you're lacking. There's something that you're missing. God is holding something back from you. And he went on to tempt them with, with the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they ate from that tree. The moment it says they ate from that tree, it says their eyes were opened. And they knew that they were naked. So now something had happened to them. So this is what I believe happened to them. I believe that spirit that God had breathed into them, that was the connection point, had now been removed, had now died. Let's put it that way. Yeah? And in the place of the spirit of life that was breathed into them, there was now the spirit of unrighteousness, the spirit of self. Because the knowledge of good and evil only gives us a knowledge of self. Because now we've got seven billion people in the world that all have a spirit of self. So they're deciding for themselves what's good and what's bad. That's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has done. It's given people an understanding that they can choose for themselves what's good and bad. But in the Bible, there's nowhere where it calls us adults. Think about that for a second. We're always God's children. In all of the songs, in all of the books, in all of the Bible, we're called the children of God. Why is that? Because we've got no clue. <laughs> I'm not talking about teenage children. I'm not talking about children, children. You know, that you have to, you know, if you let them go, they just cause riots, they would get killed or they would hurt themselves. Because you know and you understand that child doesn't understand what they're doing. This is why God calls us children. Because he knows, he's the only one that knows what is good and what is bad for us. But we've, taken, we've got, now got this spirit because it says, because of what Adam and Eve have done in the garden, let me read this to you. Because of what Adam and Eve, Eve have done in the garden, there is a consequence to it. Yeah? That original sin, that one thing, has now been passed down to person, to person, to person. Just like HIV. You know what HIV is? Yeah? If the mom and dad have HIV, what does a child have? HIV. The child has done nothing to get it. So you imagine this. When that child was born, it has HIV. When we were born, everybody in this room, everybody on live stream were born, we have a nature that is called sin. We've done nothing. We've done no, there's no acts been committed. There's no sins been committed. There's no language. There's no understanding. But when God looks at that child, God cannot accept that child because it's sin. Okay? As soon as, it's, as, soon as it comes out of its mother, before the nurse cleans it up, that child's nature is sin. That's where we are today. So it says in Romans 5.12, just to clarify and clear it up for you. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to what? To all men. Because all sinned. So this is not something that's based on how good or bad you are at all. So the child comes out. Inside of that child is a seed. Yeah? And the seed is called sin. So as the child grows, two, three years old, smashes something in the house and the mum walks in and says, what happened? And the child immediately says, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. There's nobody else in the room. There's nobody else in the house. But that child will try and convince you that they didn't do that. So they start to lie. Who taught them to lie? The sin nature inside of them. You know? 
and as that child grows, this is how, this is how I, I, I put it. The sin nature is a seed, so as it's growing, it turns into a tree. I'm going to need your help on this, guys. So this, this young child is growing and growing. The tree is growing inside of them. We have some gardeners here, so they, they know what I'm saying. And eventually, as Dexter was saying, he was a problem here, he was a problem there, he was a problem there. This tree starts producing fruit. Okay? So, here's me fruit. So guys, come on, give me some fruit. I want you all, come on, all of you out there. So there's your fruit, yeah? <laughs> so, this tree of sin is now producing fruit. And we go to church and they tell us the fruit, the sins in our life, are the things that we need to change. So we are now convicted about the fruit. And we do our best to change what's growing in our lives. We pick the fruit off. We stop swearing, stop smoking, stop sleeping around, stop taking drugs, blah, 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 blah. The list goes on. And then the next season, for those gardeners out there, what grows back? The fruit. So we go to church again. And we pray harder. Please, Jesus, help me. I need help. The, pr the priest has told me I need to change my fruit. And every single time you walk away from the church, you're convicted because you cannot stop the fruit from growing until you uproot the tree. So it says here, therefore, just as, as through one man, sin entered the world. It doesn't say sins. It's plural. It's just one. It was that one sin that was committed in the garden. Because of that one sin, there is now a tree inside of everybody that's born that grows into a tree of sin. And the fruit that you see in people's lives are sins. And we got to church, and we try and change all of our actions, hoping that this sin nature inside of us will be changed. But as I say to people on the street when I talk to them, it doesn't matter how you dress your dog. It doesn't matter what you call your dog. Call him little Benny, Freddy, whatever you want to call him. And you put little slippers on him and all that lark and stuff. Leave him in your house for two weeks and go away on holiday. And come back. And see what little Benny's done in your house. Because you don't change the dog's nature by changing what it looks like. You don't change the dog's nature by calling it by a different name. I see some people shouting at dogs, telling them to stop, stop barking, stop barking. I said to this one guy, I said, mate, it's a dog. It's what it does. It doesn't matter how many times you hit it or how many times you shout at it, it will shut up for a minute. But once you go, it will start barking again because that's what dogs do because it's their nature. So we are now born in sin. It's who we are. Or should I say it's what we are. Let's, let's, let's go there, yeah? So think about it. All of the people that have never been born again, all of the Muslims, they're, they're doing their best. All of the Jewish people are doing their best to change the fruit in their life so they can reach a God who's holy. Not understanding that their fruit isn't the issue. It's the tree that's the issue. Is this good? Good. So, sin is not what you do. Sin is what you are. Change that thinking. Okay, so 1 Corinthians says this. 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 9 to 11. Yes. So, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church that are Christians. Do you not know that the unrighteous, these are people who are not born again, unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Now, listen to the, listen to the list, please. I want to clear something else up. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, 
no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Listen to this next line. And such were some of you. So that list there, some of these Christians were those people. Okay? So some of these Christians were homosexuals. Some of these, these people were murderers. Some of these people were extortioners. Some of these people were thieves. And it says this in verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So let me just clear this up. We're on live stream, so let, let me get out of there. <laughs> God does not hate homosexuals. Christians, I'm talking about Christians that are born again, do not hate homosexuals. This list here talks about people who steal. It's in the same list as homosexuals. So if you steal a pen from a shop, you're on this list. The problem is, what we've done is, we have categorized sins, actions. And what we have to understand is, the homosexual that is committing sins, actions, has the same sin as the baby that's just been born. There's no difference. The, person, the homosexual that's committing those sins, that is the fruit of their sin. But the person who's a murderer, that's the fruit of their sin. The person who's a liar, that's the fruit of their sin. We need, as Christians, to stop categorizing sins, actions, because that's not, that's not the issue. The issue that somebody's a homosexual or a thief is not the issue. The issue is they don't know Jesus. That's the issue. Somebody needs to get on TV and start to, to explain this to people, that what you do is not the problem. It's what you are is the problem. It's because you don't know Jesus. I don't care if, you, if you're homosexual, if you're this or you're that, and you come in here, you want to know Jesus, let's do it, man. Transvestites, all these, these young people wearing wrong clothes, dressing up as women, all that stuff, whatever you want to call it, that is just the fruit of their tree. That's all that is. They're confused. They don't know who they are. And so this sin nature is producing fruit in their life. And that's what it is. And we, bang, and we see the fruit and we say, oh, these people are so confused because of the fruit. Forget about the fruit. The fruit isn't the issue. The tree is the issue, not the fruit. Okay? Amen. So sin is not what you do. Sin is what you are. We know that now, yeah? So we're talking about being, why do you need to be born again? So God gave the law. Why did God give the law? He said he gave the law to Moses. All of these people have got this understanding of good and evil, and they are their own keeper, their own judge. Everybody's doing whatever they want to do because I'm not as bad as Ruta. I oh mean, have you seen the stuff that she does? <laughs> That's bad. That's really bad. My, huh? And Nicholas, man alive, he's never going to get into heaven, the stuff he does. But this is our thinking. And this is what they're thinking, you know? They were looking and comparing themselves against each other. And that's what we do. I'm not homosexual, so I'm not that bad. I've got to go to heaven because I give money to charity. And so we've got all of these people doing all of this stuff, trying to justify themselves, telling us, telling God even, not even us, telling God, I'm a good person. I don't do bad things. They're the ones that are bad out there. So God gave the Ten Commandments so we would stop doing that. So what God said was this. Forget about all this stuff. If you can do these ten things, I will accept you. Okay? Now, I'm going to read these Ten Commandments out to us because I'm sure... Many of us don't know them. Because when I looked at them, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so here they are. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay? 
So just think about your lives and where you're from and think about people, think about yourself. Think about this list before you knew Jesus. So you're going to have no other gods apart from him. You shall have, sorry, you shall not make idols. That means, what do you worship? Do you worship money? Do you worship your children? Do you worship TV? Do you worship a star? When you, I mean, we're looking at the Sikh temple there. They've got idols in the church, in that, in that um, temple. So you sh don't uh, make idols. Don't worship anybody else apart from God. That's number two. Number three is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And let me tell you, before we were Christians, guys, whew, his name was always on my lips. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So, I mean, come on, guys, man. Who, who, who do you know keeps the Sabbath day? Anybody? I don't know anybody. Was your hand moving then, Julia? Oh, I'm glad it wasn't, because you were going to get in trouble right then, mate. <laughs> okay. Um, that's number... So that's number four. Number five, honour your father and your mother. And all of the children said... <laughs> uh, number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. And number ten, you shall not covet. That word covet means, have you ever seen anything that you think, man, I wish that was mine? Oh, I want that, I want that, I want that. That's coveting. Okay? So you've got ten laws there, ten commandments, that God said if you can do all of those, you can be perfect. Anybody? Yeah? Anybody done them yet? I've spoken to many Muslims on the streets, and I've said the list to them. I said, a guy who was 80 years old, I said, have you ever, one day of your life, been able to keep all of those commandments? And he said, no to me. I said to him, so what, what's the point then? He said, I've got to keep trying. And this is where we find ourselves. We go to church. That's the list we're trying to keep. Yeah? The Catholics, that's the list they're trying to keep. The Baptists, that's the list they're trying to keep. The Pentecostals, that's the list they're trying to keep. Us in this church, that's the list we're trying to keep. You can't do it. You cannot do it. So he gave the law, thank you for that, he gave the law to show you and to show me that we could never do it. The law was never made for us to be perfect. It was never given for us to be perfect. It was given to show us how bad we really are. So Genesis, oh, sorry, Galatians 3, 22 to 25 says this. But the scripture has confirmed all under sin, that's everybody, that the promise by faith, listen to this guys, the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under, under God by the law. So the law kept us under God before Jesus came. Kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the Lord was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So this is saying the law was guarding us. It was it just, it's like a mirror. Who's ever looked into a mirror? Yeah? And you think, oh, I need to comb my hair. Oh, I need to put my makeup on. Oh, I need to do this or I need to do that. That's what the law was. Because every time you looked at that law, you were like, oh, I've done that again. I need, to, I need to be better. So you go to confession. And the, and the priest tells you, you need to do four Hail Marys and two da 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 das And off you go, you're thinking, I feel better now. And you go and do it. Then you walk past the mirror again and you go, oh, no, I've done something else now. And you're back to square one again. You can never be justified by what you do. 
the law highlights your sinful nature. So when you're born, think about these people out there who do not know Christ. People on live stream, if you do not know Christ, you are spending your life looking into a mirror and trying to fix what you see by your natural um, power. And let me tell you, you can never do it. You can never do it. Okay, I'm going to read this out to you. This is quite a long scripture. This is Romans 5, 12 to 21. You guys got to listen to this. this is, when, I, when, I, when I read this, I've read it a while ago, but when I first read it, I was like, this is awesome. Awesome. So, verse number 20 says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin. So that's cleared up, yeah? It was because of Adam's sin that we have a sin nature. Okay? And thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. So even those people who didn't commit any sin like Adam committed were still being judged because they were sinners. That's us. We didn't do what Adam did, did we? But we're, we're being judged based on what he did. Who is a type of him who was to come? But the free gift is not like the offence. For if by one man's offence many died, Adam, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offence resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which comes from many offences resulting in justification of what Jesus did. For if by one man's offence death reigned through the one, Adam, I'm pointing to Adam, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offence, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Oh, sorry, I'm, 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 uh, one man, sorry. Therefore, as through one man's offence, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteousness act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification through life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also, by one man's obedience, Jesus, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound. But where sin is, so where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that sin reigned, so that, that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. <sighs> that was a lot. So this is saying what I said. That man sinned, and because he sinned, death and sin has now entered into the world. And everybody is being tarred with the same brush. Okay? But because Jesus has now come. What, when Jesus died on the cross, what, what did he die for? Somebody shout out to me. What did he die for? Come on, guys. Don't be scared. If you get it wrong, it doesn't matter. Just... Yeah. So one person shouts sin, somebody else reconciled back to him. This is what I believe Jesus died for. He died to pay the price for that one sin. Okay? The thing that Adam did, Jesus paid the complete price for that sin. Because he paid the price for that sin, righteousness has now entered into the world. Yeah? 
So righteousness now comes as a free gift to us. And so if we take that righteousness that Jesus has now paid for, when God looks at us, that one sin is not on our account anymore. There's nobody excited out there. There's nobody excited. Okay. <laughs> Yes, you're all too late now, forget it. The, mo the, moment, the moment's gone. <laughs> so think about this. There's a judgment coming. It, well, it's, it's already arrived, actually. <laughs> it says that judgment has already come. And it's crazy because we're looking forward to the end of the world and we're thinking, oh, there's a judgment coming. But it says the world's already been judged. It's not judged based on the things that are happening. The world is being judged based on that original sin. Think about it. All of this stuff is a consequence of that one sin. And God knew that if he dealt with that, all of this could be dealt with as well. So think about your life. Think about, the, think about your fruit. Think about what you do. Think about how you speak. Think about all of the things that you want to change in your life. Picking fruit off a tree does not stop the fruit from coming back. The only thing that will stop the fruit from coming back is to dig the tree up and chuck it away. Chuck it away. So why do we need to be born again? God created us in his image and his likeness. And because of the sin... His likeness was taken out of us. So we have no capacity, if you don't know who Jesus is, to be like God. You have no capacity to change your fruit. You have no capacity to stop doing what you do. I'm here to tell you that right now. It doesn't matter how many laws you keep, because you'll never keep the ten. It says in the, in the word, if you sin and break, in James it says this, if you break one law... You've broken them all. Here's the illustration for you. Imagine this wall here is a plate glass window, yeah? I'm standing here and Devon is standing there next to me. It's irrelevant if I have a, an air pistol and shoot the pistol at the, at the glass and make a hole that's this, this big. And Devon stands here with a rock and throws it through the window doesn't matter which one happens because the window's broken. So it doesn't matter how many times you try and keep the commandments, as soon as you sin, the smallest sin action, you've now committed all of the sins. You've now broken the law. So it doesn't matter how small your action is, or how big your action is. This is what I'm saying about homosexuals and murderers and stuff. We judge size, God's just saying, <laughs> the window's broken. It's irrelevant how big, how big the stone was. The window's broken. And somebody's got to pay for the new glass. So who's paying for the glass? It's Jesus. You can clap as well, guys. If you feel like cheering and clapping, that's good. <laughs> so, it says this. In Romans 10, 8 to 11. Romans 10, 8 to 11. We all know this. We all say it on the streets when we go to do evangelism. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So this is what I believe happens. When you hear the gospel, when somebody stands in front of you and they give you the gospel, the true gospel, not about the law 
not about your sins, not about all of this stuff, but that they tell you there's a God that died and paid for original sin. And if you accept the free gift of salvation today, right now, he will forgive you of all of your sins, all of your actions. And you will then be renewed in the spirit. He will pour into you the spirit that was in Adam at the beginning. And you can start to look like God in your spirit. Your words will change from the inside out. Your actions will change from the inside out. Your thinking will change from the inside out. If there's sickness in your body, you'll be healed from the inside out. If you need finances, it comes from the inside out. You might think finances, but everything that you need, all of the opportunities, all of the, the ideas, all of the thoughts, all of the um, direction comes from the inside out, the mind of Christ that's in your spirit. And you start to walk the life as a Christian, confessing Jesus, believing on Jesus, your life will start changing. And then, at the end, there'll be no judgment for you either. God wants us to convey the gospel in a way that tells people that your sins are not the issue. I don't care that you're homosexual. I don't care you're transvestite. I don't care about all of those things because they're just actions. But what I need to know is, do you want to know Jesus, the, the God that can change you? The God that can change you from the inside out. The God that will give you his spirit, his grace, his power to walk out his identity so you can then find your identity in him. Do you want that? That's what I want to know. Because if that's what you want, then that's what I've got for you. But if you want to tell me, I, I can change myself, I can do it myself, then, then I'll see you next summer when the fruit comes back. Because it's always going to come back. This is a good message, guys. So why do you need to be born again? You need to be born again because you were born of the flesh. Yeah? But when Adam was born, what was he born of? He was born of the Spirit. And so God wants us to be just like Adam, in the garden, having an understanding, because we are, we are in that place right now, we're going to have an understanding of what's good and what's evil. But saying, you know what, I'm not going to use my mind to try and understand this. I'm going to look at what the Father says. I'm not going to judge that person based on the world's uh, picture of what's good and bad. I'm going to look at what the Father says of what I should be judging. He says we should be judging each other in this church. Everybody out there has nothing to do with us. We don't judge the unbelievers. Why do we think that the unbelievers are going to do something that doesn't surprise us? Why do we think that? Why do we say about our relatives, our neighbours, I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they spoke like that about me. Well, why not? They're not saved. Well, how would they speak? There's a tree inside of them called sin. How would they speak about you? I can't believe I've been rejected by my parents. Well, are they born again now? Well, why would you think it would be anything different? This is what we call God's family. <laughs> because this is supposed to be your new family. It talks about in the Bible that your enemies become your brothers and sisters. The people that try to kill you have now become your, your father. You know? The people that try to hurt you have become your family because they have the same spirit as us. The people who do not have the spirit of God will do what they do from the moment they're born to the moment they die. That's why they need to be born again. You need to be born of the spirit so you can start to act and live in the spirit. If you act and live in the flesh, it says in the word, you will what will you do? Somebody tell me. If you live in the flesh, what happens to you? You die. You have depression. You have condemnation. You have guilt. You have fear. You have anger. You have all of these things because you're in the flesh. But if you're in the spirit, it says in Galatians 5.20, 
22 to 25. So this is God's spirit that he puts inside of a born-again person. But the, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That list is not found out there. Joy. Most people who don't know Jesus don't have joy. Peace. Most people who know Jesus don't have peace. Love. I'll love you based on what you can do for me. It's all conditional. Long-suffering. <laughs> you get on my nerves all of the time. This is, this is the world, isn't it? Kindness. Of course not. What's mine is mine, and I want, I want what your, what's yours as well. They don't want to give to anybody. They want to take from you. Goodness. Again, it's all conditional. I'll, I'll be good to you as long as you... Whatever it is. Faithfulness. I'll meet you at so-and-so time, and I'll be there, and I'll... Don't, no, no, we'll shake on it. And they'll let you down. This is the world. Gentleness. Well, as men, we know that it's not gentle out there, you know? Because if you're gentle as a man, then there's something wrong with you. You can't be gentle. And, then, and most women out there, if you are gentle, they, they wonder what's wrong with you. They try and take advantage of you. It's true, isn't it? Self-control. Well, look at the, the trans and the homosexuals and blah, blah, blah. There's no self-control there at all. It's do what you want, where you want, whatever you want, and you can be who you want. It's true, isn't it? The point I'm trying to make is this nature that's in born-again believers, that's what we're supposed to look like. And because you're not born again, whatever is in that list right there is what you're going to look opposite to. This is why you need to be born again. I say to people often, in the right context. To be honest, I've spoken to him and I say, to be honest, mate, I don't care if you get born again or not. This is not going to benefit me at all. You know, I'm not on the streets dancing, singing, making myself look sometimes a bit silly. I'm not doing it for my benefit. This is for your benefit. There is a gift that is available to you today if you decide to choose Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. That list, his spirit in you, and you will get life. It says he came to give us life, and that more abundantly. So as we close today, the reason we need to get born again is because we are born of the flesh, but we need to be born of the spirit to accept and to live in the life that Jesus came to give us. Amen? Amen. And if you're in this room today and you are born again, then that's who you are. But if you're not, and in live stream as well, um, right now we can just pray that prayer. There's, there's no, again, this is not religious. This is not about what you do. Please remember, your sin, your actions are a byproduct of your nature, of your sin nature. So we're not talking about what you do. We're talking about what you are. God wants to change your nature today. And so, if you've heard what I've said today, and you're asking yourself, how can I be born again? It says in the Bible that if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead, and you confess that with your mouth, you will be born again. And at that moment, God's Spirit will then come back inside of you, and you will be born again of the Spirit and not of the flesh. Amen? You can do that any time you want. You can do it now, or you can do it when you're on your own. But I ask you, think about your life. Have you tried to change yourself over and over and over and over and over? Have you tried self-help groups? Have you tried to pray? Have you tried to go to different places and it's not worked? It won't work because you're trying to change your nature by the things that you do. And you cannot change your nature based on what you do. Only God can change your nature. So you need to be born again. Amen. Guys, if you'd like to stand, we've come to the end of the service. Um, yes, let me just invite Selena back up.
Amen. So I hope you've enjoyed that, guys. Amen. I'm just going to ask the, the worship team if they want to come back up. And then I'm just going to pray, um, and then we're going to worship. So, Father, we give you thanks that you made a way, that you, you looked at us, that you looked at the whole of humanity, and you loved us that much that you made a way. You didn't leave us where we were. You didn't leave us without you. But you sent your son, you sent your Holy Spirit, you had a plan. The Bible tells us that you did this for the joy that was set before you. And that joy was knowing that we would be reunited with you. So we give you thanks and we give you, we give you honor and glory because without you, we would not be here today. Without you, we would have no hope. We would have no future. There would be nothing for us to look forward to. We would just be living the existence that we once knew which is an empty existence. An existence without you is empty. There is no meaning. There is no reason. So we give you thanks that you came to each one of us in our time of need, that you revealed yourself to us, that you, you showed us what real love is, and that you welcomed us into your family. And we give you thanks that there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, that for those of us that have accepted your free gift of righteousness we can come boldly before you in our time of need that when we fall we can get back up that we know you will never turn your back on us that you go before us you're behind us you're all around us that your voice guides us that you never ever leave us but you are always with us and we thank you that all of this is possible just because of your love towards us that your your word says that you loved and so you gave that you loved us so much that you gave your son, that that is the reason, because of your love towards us. So today we thank you that we will never, ever, ever be separated from you again, that eternal life for us started the moment that we were born again, and that we will be in your presence for the rest of eternity. There will never, ever be a separation for us. We thank you that your son went through what no born-again believer will ever have to go through, which is separation from you. So we stand here today just full of thankfulness, full of love towards you, of gratitude, that we want to share what you've given to us with other people, with those that do not know you yet. We know there's a different way. We know that you are love. We know that you love every single person on this planet unconditionally. And we want to help, help you, if that's the right way to even put it, to introduce your, your people back to you, because they do not know that you're there. They, they do not know that there is a gift available. They, they do not know that they've already been forgiven, that you've already forgiven them. So we thank you that you use us every single day to display your love to a lost and broken world. And we thank you that we are worthy to be the hands and feet of you on this world, in this world. So today we give you the glory, we give you the honor, and we give you all of the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to worship now, guys. So I just invite you to join in with us as we worship to close the service. Amen.